This is Ray Glasser, and this segment will be about my Las Vegas years, why I moved there, what I did there, how I fell in love with the city and its rich history, and why I moved back to Cleveland. My years in Las Vegas actually began in April of 1994. At that time, I was working at Corky and Lenny's Deli in South Euclid, Ohio, in the Cedar Center Shopping Center. Business there had been slipping for some time, as the neighborhood had changed. Plus, Lenny had retired, so Corky was essentially running the place by himself, and it was becoming too much for him. So in April of 1994, the Cleveland Institution closed down and sold to Fuddruckers. They had been open from 1956 to 1994. Anyway, I had had a standing job offer by a Cleveland friend of mine who had moved to Las Vegas. He was managing a deli in the Farm Shop shopping mall inside Caesars Palace. I saw him in January 1994 when my family and I went to Vegas for a short vacation. Anyway, I called my friend, told him that Corky's had closed, I needed a job. He flew me out there in May, and I began my wonderful four and a half years in Las Vegas. I flew out there with a huge suitcase full of clothes and shipped two of my Betamaxes and my computer and my small TV out there so I could at least set up my video gear temporarily. I lived with my friend in a beautiful, spacious two-bedroom apartment on Colville Lane in the Desert Club apartment complex. It was actually a prime time to move to Las Vegas. California had just had the Northridge earthquake of late 1993, and people were leaving California in droves and moving to Las Vegas. Las Vegas experienced a huge growth spurt at this time. The economy was booming. The housing market was exploding thanks to the influx of Californians and other people from all over the country. I began working at the stage jelly in the forum shops the day after I moved out there, and I liked it immediately. It was set up just like Corky and Lenny's, a deli counter when you walked in, and the dining room after the deli counter. The guys I worked with there were cool, mostly from New York, and they knew their stuff, but they also knew how to have fun. Mickey joined me about two weeks later, and we began our lives in Las Vegas. We lived with my friend for a few months, then began looking for a house. We actually found a Japanese real estate agent who Mickey bonded with instantly, and she found us a great house on the east side of town, about eight miles from the Strip. We began the purchase process and the paperwork, and finally moved in in July of 1994. July was a great month for me. We moved into our Las Vegas house, plus I attended the VSDA show at the convention center without having to fly across the country. The house was built in 1963 and was 1,920 square feet. It had four bedrooms, two living rooms, a covered back deck. It was actually pretty big for two people, but we knew we'd be having visitors from Cleveland every now and then, which we did. The house worked out beautifully. I took one bedroom and made it into my video room, and it even had a half bath attached to it. In September, Mickey and I flew back to Cleveland and packed up some essentials plus all my audio and video gear, threw it all in a big U-Haul, and my younger son drove it out to Las Vegas. I shot a video of my video room the way it had been since 1982 in my Mayfield Heights house so I could recreate it tape by tape and wall by wall in Las Vegas. We flew back, we unloaded the trailer, and began the huge process of recreating my video room. After about a week, it was finally done, and we settled into our life in Las Vegas. For me, it was a godsend living there for many reasons. No more winters, no more blizzards, and no more airplane trips to fly to Vegas to attend the two trade shows that I went to every year, the CES in January and the VSDA show in July. Our house was great, I loved my video room, and the job was much easier than Corky and Lenny's. We were on our way. Over the years, we had lots of visitors from Cleveland, both friends and family. Mickey and I both have Mondays and Tuesdays off, so one night we ate at home, the other night we went out to a casino and we had dinner. It was a great life. But in September of 1994, there was a bump. The owner of the stage deli where we were both working sold the deli and his last day as the owner was Halloween day of 1994. I shot some video that day. We both stayed there under the new ownership for a while, but I didn't really care for the new owners or the way they ran the place. So I got my second job in early 1995 at a casino way up on the northern end of the city, the Santa Fe, still around as Santa Fe Station. Even though the deli was in an atrium at the back of the casino, it was really cool working next to the casino. I loved the atmosphere. I remember when I took my lunch break in the Santa Fe's employee dining room, how cool it was to see the casino employees in so many different uniforms, cocktail waitresses, doormen, poker dealers, and so forth. I loved it. The deli wasn't that busy, 
and the guy who ran it worked with me at the stage in the forum shops, and we were friends anyway. Anyway, this job lasted until the spring of 1995, when I changed jobs for the second time since I moved there. The owner of the stage deli in the forum shops, Joel, approached me and asked me if I wanted to come on board with him in the MGM Grand, where he had converted a snack bar into a mini stage deli, which was basically a carryout, and he called it the Stage Deli Express. We discussed things like money and hours, and I went for it. I actually worked there for the rest of my time in Las Vegas. There was no kitchen, no waitresses, no dining room. The customers bought their food and carried the food on a tray into the huge sports book area, which is right across from the deli, and that was essentially our seating area. It worked out beautifully. In December of 1995, a major Las Vegas development happened with the closing of downtown Las Vegas as a roadway, and construction began on the Fremont Street experience evening its fabled past will be forever etched in our memories. It's one of the most photographed and one of the most famous streets in the world. John Bonds joins us live now from the Fremont Street with his special report. John. We're underneath the wonderful canopy that makes up the new Fremont Street. We were told earlier this evening they had another light show and we've also been told that it was fantastic. Of course a lot of folks come down here to see the new Fremont Street experience but for many people the old Fremont experience will always hold a special place in their hearts. It was just an awesome view. It just took your breath away and everybody would go, oh, look at this, all the lights. Now that the long hype space frame is about to open with its promise of more tourists and more bucks. But can it ever replace the excitement, fun, and neon madness that made Fremont Street famous around the globe and forever changed? But will it regain the glory? Well, back here live, we'll all be able to answer that question for ourselves come December 14th. That's when the Fremont Street experience opens officially to the public. But by looking at the crowds that have just assembled here tonight, it looks like it's on its way to success. Anyway, life is good. Throughout 1995, 96, and 97, we always had visitors from Cleveland and other places, and that plus our jobs kept us busy. In early 1998, the stage jelly in the forum shops where Mickey was still working was sold again, and she had a hard time with the new owners. Eventually, things came to a head, and they gave her a two-week suspension. She wound up quitting, and she announced to me that she missed her family and wanted to move back to Cleveland. All the kids were getting married and having families of their own, and she missed them. She flew back to Cleveland in the summer of 1998 and immediately went back to working at Corky and Lenny's. And I began packing up her house, and I put it on the market. Luckily, we had kept our house in Mayfield Heights just in case we ever moved back, and it's a good thing that we did. We finally sold the Las Vegas house in October and moved back to Cleveland on November 1st. I shot video of a lot of the trip back home with two cars and a huge U-Haul. The move was traumatic for me because I loved my Las Vegas life and I didn't want to go back to the Cleveland winters, but I did. I was miserable for about six months after moving back. After all, we moved back right before winter, but I eventually got over it. So the four and a half wonderful years of my Las Vegas life were over. While I lived there, I really fell in love with the city and especially its rich history. I began taping everything I could about Las Vegas' colorful past. I still have lots of documentaries on tape from A&E, the History Channel, and so forth about the early years of Las Vegas, and they're still being aired to this day. And since I don't gamble, working in a casino was a breeze for me. I love the upbeat atmosphere, and I got a kick out of hearing people go crazy when they wanted slots. So that's my life in Las Vegas from 1994 to late 1998. It was a great run. Yes, I still miss it, but not as much, obviously, as I used to since I've been back in Cleveland over 30 years now. So that's this edition of the Ray Glasser story. Hope you enjoyed it. See you next time.